So I've got a, a, a few questions for the panelists, and then I welcome the audience to cook up a few as well. Um, first, I wanted to uh, ask Pauline, um, as, as FarmWise or other ventures like that in your life grow, um, what kind of, uh, not necessarily majors, but skill sets and um, knowledge do you find ideal for students that you would be recruiting? So the good news is that we recruit, I'd say, across the board. Uh, we are always looking for experienced techs and fabricators. Um, those are our, say, some of our most precious resources, and also the high, the harder to actually find, as everybody, you know, the entire Salinas Valley fights for techs. Um, people who are, you know, hydraulics experts, people who are electricians. Um, it is, it is a challenge. Um, so there's that, and then when it comes down to engineering, the bad news here is, or like, I wish I had a better kind of story to tell, but we do hire a lot outside of ag, like people who have no context and worked on, in the space industry, in um, electronics industry, um, autonomous vehicle, which is very, I'd say, like dominant, big tech also, we've had people coming um, from Apple, Amazon and whatnot. So we are fighting with companies who have much more resources, budget, perks, and you name it that you know you wouldn't imagine before actually like getting to know about these programs. So it is really challenging to hire them. So what we hire them on is is the mission, the mission and the vision, and like we work on real technology. Like we we are not working on a product that will have reality in 50 years. We're working on a product that has an impact on the farm today, that generates cash, that saves growers all from a lot of pains. Um, so so that is that is not all we have to offer, but that is a big kind of piece of the puzzle for us, that or a card that we have to lay on the table in order to hire those talents. So uh, in the world of engineering, we seek um, electrical engineers, mechanical, hardware engineers, computer science folks, um, so people with front-end development, back-end development, machine learning, uh, computer vision, camera perception experts, um, and you name it, embedded software engineers, so people who integrate um, who help our machine be precise, like, oh, how do I take this input from the camera and turn it into this smart action, like the movement of the blade, for instance, in the ground. Like, those folks are really, I'd say, precious commodity and hard to find. So, mm -hmm. a lot of fields. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Very nice, thank you. Um, next question I have is may maybe um, Umberto can take a swing at it, and maybe Danny, and maybe maybe Pauline, too. but. Um, uh, one point I alluded to would be was uh, that we have these um, these devices. Um, they look like maybe they're not terribly cheap. Um, what added value can be incrementally added to these types of things? And maybe uh, maybe start with Umberto. And uh, I think you you mentioned your CO two B device. And maybe uh, we give a little bit of of, of additional information of, of some directions you've been going with that. Yeah, so that CO2B device that I showed earlier in that slide, if you remember it, it kind of looks like a little chamber, almost like, like Wally, if you've seen that Disney movie. <laughs> um, essentially, it's this little chamber that we put on top of the soil, make sure that it has a good seal so that no CO2 is escaping. We hit start, and then it starts logging the CO2 as it's climbing. And yeah, I've been using it at the at the farm site now for a while and just keeping all that data and essentially couple, coupling it with that model I shared to eventually, you know, cross validate because do we really trust trust computers that much, you know? We we also need to validate out in the real world. So, essentially it's what I've been using it for just um, coupling what, and what and wh who's been doing that? Who's been doing the actual CO2s? We yeah. got a we, we got a team. We got it's not just me. We got even Dr. Harmon's been out there. Um, some people in the public, even Angel, if you remember him from an earlier panel. So we got a few. We got undergrads out there. So what about next year? Who do we hope's doing it next year? That's a good question. I don't know. 
The, well, oh, we, well, we have a robot. <laughs> there we go. I don't know if I was supposed go. to reveal that. But we have a, a robot in the works. Uh, hopefully, eventually, it'll, it'll go out there so we don't have to. And it won't just do CO2. It'll have some, some prongs on there to measure the soil temperature and moisture. And along other things, hopefully implement some computer vision to it or some LIDAR technology so we can look at the canopy, et cetera. Yeah. If you're familiar with the burrows or the Amigos, these little carts that know their way back to the truck and that sort of thing, we've been working with, an, with some uh, Stefano Carpine in our computer science department about an actuated arm on the rover so it can just put the chamber down every once in a while and do and take the place of the displace our undergraduate helpers. So we'll have to find something else for the undergraduate helper yeah. to do. But I'm sure they'll be happy. Yeah, it gets hot out there. Danny, you want to take a crack at added value on tractor or something? So, I mean, the carbon comes to mind, but it's such an abstract space, especially in um, specialty crops right now. But, you know, more and more we need to move to systems that monitor and measure digitally, or not even necessarily digitally, but we don't have to do much to measure it. The, the collection of the data becomes easier, and as we move towards, and now blockchain doesn't have a good connotation, but forever that's what we talked about, but as we move towards more transparent and secure ways of transferring information between spaces, I think that things like these, you know, a robot that's going out and pulling out, you know, carbon uh, emissions at different stages of cultivation, um, or after different applications that we're doing in the field um, at different stages of growth. I think there's interesting things you can start um, quantifying in terms of carbon metrics, but right now it's really hard because it's so abstract. So that's definitely one of those five to 10 year, you know, problems, but it's definitely something we should be focused on today. Pauline, any ideas? Um, so our, we, we take high resolution photographs, I'd say, of, of plants. So there's a couple of stuff we can draw out of that, whether it's counting the stems, uh, we are drawing the contour, like the outer edges of the leaf. So we're, we have, um, I would say, an approach of the diameter of the plant. We also have like the stem to stem spacing. So we're able to offer a couple of data back to the farmers, which I think are of value. They, it, that allows them to evaluate the performance of previous operation, like how is my emergence rate doing, my stand, like did my transplanting contractor mess up transplanting or did someone like run over crops, like there's poor emergence at this side of the field, maybe I should investigate. So that's what we're interested in, kind of giving back from the data that's what we are, it is easy for us to give back and what we're interested to give back. I think now sky's the limit. We have a machine that traverses the field. So as you're doing that, might as well, you, you could potentially envision adding other sensors. So our little box that generate lights and capture the images have, you know, right now have, I would say, an overkill amount of uh, computing power and we could add other camera lenses to be able to capture different things, whether it's a measure of the chlorophyll level index or other kind of light reflectance. So we're very eager to partner with people who have kind of use cases in mind for our technology um, in our industry. So we're predominantly serving, I'd say, your leafy greens and coal crop growers. Um, having an estimation of yield is very interesting. Usually it's done by, with through human forecasters with, you know, kind of like simple math and some samples, you know, out in the field. So having a, a way to kind of have data at scale for that that could maybe help those forecasters review their prediction rather than replacing the forecasters necessarily. But just having, you know, some like benchmark would be useful. So that's something we're eager to work on um, with grower partners. Outstanding. I'm going to come back here at Lee and Pauline on this one. Um, I'm intrigued by the, the by the expression inclusive innovation and uh, there are different levels of innovation, right? There's somebody who realizes I can use um, uh, machine learning to recognize weeds. Um, but there's also uh, the person who realizes I can build a better actuator than anybody, and actuators are used in everything. Um, do you see that fitting in, that the, the second type, second level of innovation as a good fit for some uh, 
bringing being more inclusive in the valley. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how to respond. Do you yeah. have a ready response? I don't. I stumped Tom, the always with I stumped the, hard the panel. <laughs> Nailed it. I think um, for inclusive innovation, and this came through many conversations with the Central Valley Community Foundation and our community partners, is that um, there's a whole part of F3 that is focused on local food production, and that means like making salsas and um, working with uh, very small food operations, and then also working with local farmers um, of all scales, a lot of small farms. Um, uh, I've worked with Ruth Dahlquist Willard for a long time uh, with uh, followed her work as she helped Hmong farmers navigate the drought, and I often think about them. Um, how can they access the technology? You know, we lost our a wonderful strawberry farm in uh, Merced uh, due to rent and issues with uh, water access. Um, and so how can these interventions serve the farms, maybe ones that are embedded with communities? Um, and so I feel like thinking of a specific litmus test and having those use cases where um, can they access it, can they access it, can they afford it, what are, what are the, um, who's being excluded from this technology is I think a question we'll have to ask of every intervention and how can we make it more inclusive. So um, for example, at the World Ag Expo, we saw a um, farmer driving the Amigo and um, like not speaking English. So it doesn't have to be in many languages to recognize um, how useful a small weeder could be on many scales of, uh, of agricultural production. That's yeah, so inclusion is a, I'd say it's a tough concept because it can be interpreted in so many ways. Um, I'll, I'll say it because it's obvious maybe. Um, I'm the only representative of my company here today. We're, we're 70 people and I'm a woman, so and I'm sitting next to a woman and I think this industry could use more uh, women, so pretty proud of that. Um, now, inclusion, inclusion on our side is making sure that we're building, we're including the people we're serving in the product development. Um, you know, there is no technology that gets built without the farmers, and we, we've, we built a service business. Um, that's what, how we've been kind of generating uh, revenue over the past few years, and that's been our way to put the technology into growers' hand and get first-hand feedback, and kind of, that's how we've been iterating on the design, like both software and hardware over the past five years, and that's how we've been able to come up with this next generation, which we think is like a total, like next a step up from anything we've seen in the market. So without them, there is no product, there is no company, there is no farmwise, um, because our investors, which are Silicon Valley firms, will ask for growers' approval um, before you know, sending us the check. And if farmers are not saying they believe in what we're doing and if they like what they see, what they're using, how their operators are you know, using the equipment, like we don't get any money, so we don't go anywhere. Um, so that's been, I'd say, the, the journey for us is how can we you know, be mindful of their time, make sure that we're you know, bringing efficiency and value to their organization while also developing the products. Um, and I believe there is a irreducible field time that needs to happen before you can actually successfully achieve that. So um, I feel like we're finally getting there, but that's, I'd say, our approach to inclusion um, and making sure that you know, we cater to the communities. Uh, we hire a lot of um, local workforce. We upskill a, lo a lot of local workforce. We have a team of 25 people, and we're a small company, but we have a team of 25 like mechanic, pe operational folks, um, mechanics, fabricators, um, inventory folks, um, sales managers, and, and field scouting crews. So these people are coming from ag, from the community, and, and we try to do you know, our best to source from those rather than, I'd say, uprooting people from elsewhere. I'll just add one thing from our research at UC Merced that um, we found representation in the media that um, there was little reference of connection to SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, 
to communities. It was largely represented as an agricultural issue, and so it kind of excludes the communities, at least that um, one sect of media. Some other people do a better job out there. Um, but uh, I think your point about the communities is really important. Like Citrus is focused on the interests of society and making that technology available, but also the impacts available to a broader uh, uh, community. And I think some earlier panelists talked about how um, uh, the not only are we all affected by agriculture here, but agriculture affects it, what's grown here affects the world and um, we all eat here. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the group? A great, great panel, thank you. I do have a question, I believe it's for Danny. Uh, you had mentioned on the 42 acres that it wasn't a lot of land, obviously, for extensive research. Uh, one of the questions that I have is related to geographical bias and the soils. Um, obviously, if you have 42 acres, but it's one composition, so you know sandy loam is going to behave differently than clay soils in a certain regional environment, so forth and so on. So I love the idea of having all the data collection and being able to use that data to find un unfound correlations in the data, being able to create predictive models, uh, potential yields, et cetera. How do you get around some of the regionalization? Would you bring in soils from other regions? So I would say that our farm isn't gonna be very focused on that type of agronomic research. It, we might have researchers who are, and that would be their place to bring in that more regional data and have a more regional look. I think what we're going to have a lot more of is little robots running around trying to sense things in different ways and then creating templates and models for how to collect that data, put it into, I don't want to call it a database, but put it into a lake or a warehouse that can then be fed into a modeling system that can train an, a, a machine to learn. So I don't know that we're going to be looking at very specific agronomic research like that, so that's not incorporated into kind of my thought process. But if a researcher came and said, hey, I want to do this here, and I'm doing this other researcher around soils in these other five places, I'm going to be able to give them all the data they need from our place. Yeah, just to add a, a few sentences, we, we, in, we envision uh, having the blocks well characterized and monitored, sort of a canvas for the researchers to do their work on. They'll know their moisture, they'll know their microclimate in that zone. But we'll tell them, you know, you're on block 28 and it's a little clay. Is that going to affect your plants? You know, that sort of thing. Hmm? We can probably hear you. Yeah, we can probably hear you. <laughs> it's a bunk. Thank you. Um, so how large a plot would you have to have for the Vulcan? system or what do you call it to be cost effective yeah that's that's that was also something i wanted to mention about inclusion which i forgot is right now our system is going to provide like a two to three year roi like payback period for a farm that's farming over two thousand acres of land um so that's we're not catering to small farmers yet so our journey is definitely going to be one that how do we make sure that we nurture other segments. Um, one could say that this is a state of the world and it's very sad, but we, we see more and more consolidation of farmland, so we're gonna see more and more like those absentee landowners or mega, like they're still, fam they might be still family farm, but they farm on tens of thousands of acres, so they are a very good candidate for what we do. They might have operations in different regions, so they're, they are transferring equipment from region A to B, like let's say Salinas Valley down to Yuma, Imperial Valley in the winter. So these guys are definitely our people at the moment. Um, now moving on, like one, you know, you, your small company, you gotta be focused and you gotta allocate your dollar on the right thing until you can just have be a tentacular organization and serve many, many different people. I think we'll get there. The great news about that, in my opinion, is that the cost of developing those technology has gone down. That's why we exist 
um, it's going to keep going down, and that's what's going to be making it possible for us to deliver products to smaller farmers. Uh, especially thinking about other regions we might serve, like European, you know, farmers might be uh, structured differently, right? Like Salinas Valley is the only valley in the world that is set up that way. Question up here. So um, first, I just wanted to mention I'm glad to see another French woman working in AgTech <laughs> here. So <laughs> that's that's cool. Um, so that being said, um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I miss it, but I wanted to know uh, what kind of crops do you have in your uh, smart farm actually in UC Merced? So uh, for the last probably we aren't 100 percent sure, but 100 years or so, the land that we're developing the farm on has been irrigated pasture. Um, there has been a period on some of the land we're not, I can't verify on our plot specifically whether there's been corn and some other row crops that have actually been produced. Uh, what we're doing right now is uh, we have a winter forage planted that we planted in the fall. It's the first time the ground has been tilled uh, in, in a good period. We actually aren't 100% sure when the last time it was tilled. Um, so we're starting with the winter forage and then we'll move into a grass heavy and forage heavy crop rotation on probably 80% of the land and then move into on that other 20% more intensified row crops. And right now, this is our first year having anything planted ever. So this is a blank slate. So I don't even have a new irrigation system yet. We're in, that should be getting installed this summer. And once that happens, we'll have a whole lot more modularity and flexibility in what we're doing. But the crop plan is kind of a blank slate. So if somebody came to me and said we want to do some research, I would say I need to figure out what it's going to cost, <laughs> and then we could come to some sort of agreement because we aren't even at the point where we have those types of service level agreements or those types of contracts in place yet. We're developing all those types of governance programs and systems as I'm speaking. And one more up here. Oh. Okay, um, I have a question um, on the robots. Um, are they the intention of adding also? Uh, ways to actually um, check, you know, do radar uh, detections for like salinity for, uh, and all that stuff in, in the future or right now? Or is there something already on the way maybe like, you know, to calculate that? So I think there's a couple ways to answer that question. One is there are absolutely people who are working on complete solutions to do those types of things. I think what's unique though, and we, we've hit on it a couple times, um, one of the neat solutions out there right now, not to take away from the awesome work that FarmWise is doing, but a different solution that's more of just a platform is the, we've said Amigo, it's the Amiga from FarmNG. And I think that that's a really interesting platform because it's super cost effective, it's very cheap, it's got open source programming that allows, you know, if, if I'm just got out of school and I'm going back to my family farm or maybe I have greenhouses or I have something like that and I know how to do some base coding, I can learn how to use this and start doing different things that I need done around the farm. And then I think the fact that it's so versatile and open source in the programming, it opens the door for research institutions to start putting the attachments onto them. So like at UC Merced, we have Stefano Carpine who has software engineers that are programming different routes and how to make it move and stop and recognize that, hey, we need to stop here. And then we have uh, Reza Sini. Did I say his last name right? I think I did. So then we have him looking at the mechanical side with another unit where they're looking at what types of attachments could we put on this that could do different mechanization, that could do different sensing. So I think we're at a really interesting time uh, for the development of those types of technologies because we're starting to see these base platforms that are affordable and that's going to allow a whole lot more innovation to happen on top of that. Um, similar to uh, the, the drone that flies and grabs the apples, you know, they've found that partnering with a platform that's already existing is a whole lot better than recreating their own platform. So I think that as we see those platforms that, that are becoming base, and now we can start attaching to them, things to them, and the, the, the data is operable between the two, it's going to accelerate the the adoption of these types of technologies substantially faster than we've seen in the last decade. Um, so I realize a food forest doesn't exactly fit in with what you're planning right now and what you're doing, but I think when you mentioned a community garden down the road perhaps, I wondered, yeah, whether food forestry is also something so, you'll be looking at. 
so long as I'm understanding food forestry cor correctly, we are going to have, so like we have windbreaks that, you know, our architects we've worked with, and those windbreaks are gonna end up being edible windbreaks. So instead of putting a hedgerow up, we're gonna put a pomegranates up. Or, you know, look at olives um, specifically. So looking at types of infrastructure that's going into the design and making sure it's edible and multi-use. So yes, we're going to block the wind, but we're also going to make utilization out of the water that we're gonna to have to use to grow that vegetation and produce some fruit that, you know, I know our chancellor likes pomegranates, so that's definitely why it's on my radar. Hey, great stuff. This is kind of a late afternoon musing, maybe something for Humberto. So with the CO2 flux monitoring, for example, how much in reality and in your modeling comes down to the physical chemistry of the CO2 flux, like the partial pressures and the solubility, versus how much of the flux is driven by bio biologically? And, and then drilling a bit deeper, what's the capacity or vision for the smart farms to do monitoring of microbiomes based on composition and um, the physio physical chemistry? Yeah, I would say for our model, it's, it's not too good at the biological part in terms of microbial diversities and everything. There's people at our university working on that, uh, Tamara and them. But um, I, I would say our model, and it's showing that it's very much the physical properties that are kind of dictating the CO2 efflux. I don't like any more, but once you nail that down, yeah. that CO2 flux with the physical chemical conditions, the other physical things like light, you can kind of control for that. Any difference, you can start to look at how much that is biologically mediated. Yeah. Yes, yes, that would be some next steps for us to take, is start looking at the microbial diversities and the chemistry yeah. deeper. Yeah. So far, so far, and he, Umberto showed the model results today, but he's also got some wonderful empirical uh, data sets that show hot spots and hot moments that, um, you know, clear, I mean, the microbes are, microbes and, and roots and things are, are doing it, but the moisture and the temperature is kind of mediating it. And you'll actually, we, we haven't quite verified it yet, but you can kind of see the edge of the clay area where nothing can come out and it's kind of cascading out the side and stuff. So it's also the scale of what you're looking at. And, and uh, later, hopefully by next week, we'll have our, our first flux tower up so we can see the CO2 flux, sort of big footprint and how does that compare to the point scale numbers. We've been pulling eDNA um, samples at different stages of cult like when we did our cultivation we did pre-cultivation and then we i ended up making a couple passes so after one pass they came in pulled samples same location so there's been other that's aaron hester so there's been other labs that are coming in and pulling those data sets together and we're in the process as they get those data sets together we're bringing them into our lake so that way they're available we hope the smart farm will just keep getting smarter so that you know, all of a sudden that the canvas in, that includes moisture and temperature and microclimate also includes CO2 fluxes and then a couple of microbiologists come out there and scratch their head and say, oh, I wanna do a study and look at the biomes and why, why this pattern looks this way. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. We're gonna wrap up this panel and move to our closing remarks, but that was fantastic. Um, yeah.